Good afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this very important meeting of the City Council as we do the people's work. At this time, would you please stand for the invocation, which will be delivered by Councilman Dr. Curtis Edmonds, Sr., followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Edmonds. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you, Lord, for assembling us here to carry out the business of our city. We ask God that you give us focus and soundness, clarity of speech, that, Lord, we all might be on the same accord to move our city ahead. We thank you for what you have already done and the things that you are yet to do. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Members of the City Council, would you please indicate your presence electronically? There are seven members of Council present. Okay. Members of the City Council, you have before your consideration the minutes of a call meeting of June 24th, 2013, a call meeting of June 25th, 2013, and a regular meeting of June 25th, 2013. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Move adoption. You have a motion in a, in a second and you will be voting electronically. Okay. The minutes have been adopted 7-0. Okay, Madam Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen, city council rules require a limit of up to five minutes to speak. As you approach the speaker's podium, you will notice a timer. At the beginning of your time, you will see a green light. Four minutes into your remarks, you will notice a yellow light. At the end of your five minutes, you will hear a beep and see a red light and we ask that you please conclude your remarks at this time. Public hearing, 13-288, public hearing on use permit applications. UP 13-06, Mount Hermon, Interstate Sign Company requests a use permit to replace the existing pylon and price signs with new signs at an unmanned field station at 2401 Turnpike Road. The property is owned by Quarles Petroleum is zoned IN industrial. The comprehensive plans generalized future land use map recommends this site as part of a mixed use corridor. Vision principle, a robust economy for working men and women. Electronic roll call. Mr. Mayor, member, members of city council, my name is Jonathan Hartley, planning administrator in the city planning department. Your first application this evening is a request to replace an existing sign with a new pylon or pole sign at Quarles Fuel Center on Turnpike, Turnpike Road. On the left you have the existing sign, while on the right you have the zoning map which indicates that the, the property is zoned uh, industrial IN. And in this zoning <coughs> district, uh, a sign requires a use permit, uh, which is why it's before you tonight. This is an aerial photo of the, of the, the site. The site is uh, indicated in yellow, uh, and it's located at the intersection of Turnpike, and Confederate a Turnpike Road and Confederate Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a photo looking north or, or northeast along Turnpike Road, and then a uh, follow-up looking west or southwest um, along Turnpike Road. Oops, excuse me. This is a photo of the of the uh, fueling center. It's a it's a private, essentially a private fueling center used by businesses uh, and fleet vehicles. It is not open to the public uh, in general. Has no canopies. There are four pump islands, a uh, operations building, and uh, and a uh, and the sign that's uh, being requested. On the, on the left, you have the existing sign. Uh, on the right, you have the proposed sign. Uh, the proposed sign will be 14.3 feet tall. Uh, the requirement in this district is no higher than 26 feet. And the area of the proposed sign um, is 58 square feet, and the maximum area in this district is 125 feet. 
The Planning Commission considered this item at their, at their meeting on June 4th and recommended approval with the conditions by a vote of seven to zero. And that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll attempt to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members of council, I have no registered speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on this item, please come forth, state your name and address for the record, and you will be given five minutes to speak. Appearing to be none, um, this public hearing is now closed. We have a motion and a second, and you will be voting electronically. This item was approved seven to zero. UP 13-07, Truxton, Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church requests a use permit to operate a daycare center Monday through Friday in the church facilities located at 3310 Deep Creek Boulevard and 14 through 27 Manley Street. The comprehensive plans generalized future land use map recommends this site for institutional uses. Vision principle, a robust economy for working men and women. And I have no registered speakers. Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, again, my name is Jonathan Hartley, Planning Administrator in the City Planning Department. This next application is for a use permit to operate a child daycare center at Mount Carmel Baptist Church at the intersection of Deep Creek Boulevard and Portsmouth Boulevard. On the left, you have a picture of the church, and on the right, you have the zoning map for the area. Uh, the, area the surrounding area is, is zoned historic residential. Uh, it's part of the Truxton Historic District. Again, you have an aerial photo with the site highlighted in yellow. Uh, the site is surrounded primarily by single family residential development. Uh, there is some open space which is owned by the city of Portsmouth uh, to the east of the, uh, of the property and some commercial activity uh, to the north, northeast. This is a view from the of the church from the corner, and then looking back at the intersection of Deep Creek uh, and Portsmouth Boulevard, uh, looking essentially northeast. As I indicated before, it's mainly surrounded by residential uses. Uh, the top photo is on Manley Street, which is the street behind the church, uh, and then Portsmouth Boulevard and some of the homes uh, in the Truxton Historic District. The church proposes to keep up to 26 children five days a week. The facility contains sufficient off-street parking for the use and, has, and, has, and meets the required drop-off and pickup space required by the zoning ordinance. The playground would be located at the rear of the building where the, uh, on, on Manley Street in the area presently used for parking of church vans as seen in the lower photo uh, on, the, uh, on the left. This is an overall depiction of the site, and you have the drop-off and pickup area in yellow, uh, which again is a requirement of the ordinance, and then the playground is in the, in the green in, in, in the lower part of the photo. Um, the Planning Commission uh, at their meeting on, on June 4th uh, recommended approval of, of the proposed use permit with the conditions by a vote of seven to zero, and that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on this item, please come forth, state your name and address for the record, and you will be given five minutes to speak. Appearing to be none, this public hearing is closed. Second. We have a motion and a second, and you will be voting electronically. This item has been approved seven to zero. City Manager's Report 13-289, adoption of a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a deed of vacation and release of a drainage easement at 300 White, White Street, Vision Principal, Vision Principal, Effective Responsive Government, electronic roll call, and I have no registered speakers. Second. second. We have a motion and a second, and you will be voting electronically. Okay. 
This item was adopted 7-0. New business, 13-290, Boards and Commissions. Councilman Moody. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. I'd like to uh, move that the following citizens be appointed to a special ad hoc committee uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, deliberating uh, whether Portsmouth is going to accommodate uh, uh, food trucks, if you may. Uh, the citizens are uh, Jean Breckenridge, uh, Alice Amory, Louis Napa, Curtis Lyons, Corey D. Wells, and Candace Reed. Second. You have a motion and a second, and you'll be voting electronically. These appointments have been adopted 7 0. Also, uh, since we're always seeking uh, new volunteers for our boards and commissions, I'm going to have the vice mayor is going to go over some, uh, some needs that we have. Thank you, Mr. Moody. For those in the audience as well as those at home, we have immediate vacancies uh, on the following boards. Behavior Health Care Services Advisory Board, we have one position. The Historic Preservation Commission, we have two positions for residents in uh, the Historic District of Port, Port Norfolk and Old Town. And uh, Portsmouth Parking Authority, we have one position. The Portsmouth Ports and Industrial Commission, we have one position. And the Social Services Advisory Commission, we have one position. On the Supplementary Report, Retirement Board, we have one, two positions, as well as two positions on the Wetlands Board. So we encourage you to uh, the, the go online and submit your application or call the clerk's office and they'll be glad to assist you. Thank you. 13-291, items submitted by council members. Thank you. Let me um, first of all say, um, how pleased we were last week to have the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Greener, to visit Hampton Roads. And as you all know, he is the, the big cheese. He runs all of the operations of the Navy and rarely does he get here to Hampton Roads. And uh, Congressman Randy Forbes invited him here to speak and talk about sequestration and a lot of the other things that are looming in the area. And it was uh, quite a event. We had all of the mayors in the region there, and uh, the Admiral was quite impressed with the participation of all the elected officials. And uh, I want to thank Congressman Randy Forbes for his efforts in bringing him here, because we all understand the importance of the Department of Defense here and in this region. It's about 48 percent of our economy. And so that's extremely important. So we want to uh, thank the Admiral for coming and, and thank Congressman. Uh, also, on uh, 4th of July, I had the great pleasure of meeting a Portsmouth resident who received the Congressional Gold Medal or Medal of Honor, and his name was Mr. William Randolph Davis. I didn't set out uh, to meet Mr. Davis. I uh, actually went to visit um, James Overton. He was home. Uh, and uh, his wife said she wanted me to meet her Uncle Rudy, and that Uncle Rudy had received this Medal of Honor and uh, wanted to know if she could call and make an appointment for me to meet Uncle Rudy. And I said, well, no, let's go meet Uncle Rudy now. And uh, we got in the car and drove over, and I had no idea. Uncle Rudy was a gentleman named Mr. William Rudolph Davis, graduated from I.C. Norcom in 1941. Uh, he was one of the first of 20,000 Marines, African-American Marines, that were admitted into the Marine Corps after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order Number 8802, authorizing and allowing African-Americans the right to fight for their country and to enter the Marine Corps. Uh, he served in World War II and was discharged in 1946. And I spent three hours on that man's porch. And he was quite thrilled to see the mayor on 4th of July on his porch talking to him about his time that he served in the South Pacific Islands. And so it was quite a thrill. And uh, um, it was interesting that uh, the president recognized all of those Marines from, uh, and they, they call it Munfoot Point. 
and it was down in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, but back then the, the African Americans and the whites couldn't train together, so they created a training site just adjacent to it, and uh, they recognized or tried to recognize all of the existing ones that were still alive, and they left off Uncle Rudy and a couple other people, and so they did a local ceremony here for that, so that was quite an honor and a privilege. So, uh, Uncle Rudy, if you're listening, uh, I really appreciate you spending your 4th of July with the mayor and, uh, and, and all of the things that you do and, and all of our others do for our country. And then finally, I finally had the walk of a lifetime with the Cavalier Manor Civic League. And uh, uh, I think we walked about a mile and a half, Mr. Wright. And uh, I was trying to slow down for him and he was trying to slow down for me. Uh, but uh, it was quite a walk. and. Uh, one of the highlights I did get out of that, Mr. Rowe, was uh, all of the members of the Civic League are really appreciated the environmental inspectors that we have out there. I think you rotate them through Cavalier Manor, and it was quite a few compliments of what the city was doing and how uh, we were making sure that everybody was in compliance. And so that's always good news to hear. But uh, uh, with that, are there anybody other reports? Mr. Moody? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I attended over July the 4th, uh, the Craddock uh, community had their 95th uh, Independence Day celebration and uh, a few of the speakers, uh, former Vice Mayor uh, Charles Whitehurst, who's a Marine Corps veteran, and also uh, another Marine uh, uh, Sergeant Major uh, Toller, uh, who we see here uh, frequently. Uh, both of them uh, gave speeches, the Vice Mayor uh, Cherry gave the uh, uh, welcoming uh, remarks, but uh, they had had a bike parade. If you if you've never been to a Craddock <laughs> ceremony, uh, it's kind of special. It really gives a small town uh, flavor to it, and uh, make, makes you feel good about uh, what the real meaning of Independence Day is. Uh, so that was real good. Also stopped by Long Point had their first annual barbecue cook off I understand you uh, uh, you were there earlier yes, uh, mayor uh, had a couple of plates of barbecue and lemon meringue pie no, I, I'm just kidding because I know he didn't but uh, they uh, it was their first annual uh, uh, barbecue cook off and uh, they, they plan on having it uh, every year about the same time so. okay thank you dr. Edmonds thank you mayor uh, fellow council Councilmen and Councilwomen, uh, to the audience that's here and those that are watching on television, I was invited to a Walmart uh, talk concerning veterans. Hiring, they wanted to hire uh, 100,000 veterans, and they've set out an initiative to do so. They have a, a five-year program set forth, and they have $10 million in that commitment to hire 100,000 veterans. And they wanted to come to the Hampton Roads area, and they met in the Sheraton over at Norfolk. I wish they could have met at the Renaissance, but that's okay. Um, and they have a strong support group and wanted some advice from some of the folk that they invited. Congressman Bobby Scott uh, got up and said some words. Uh, Delegate Matthew James was there. Birdford from uh, Norfolk uh, City Council was there as well. The head of this for Walmart is retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Gary Prophet. He's the Senior Director, Director of Military Programs for Walmart. And this is the statement that they wanted me to share. On May the 27, 2013, Walmart launched their commitment to offer jobs to recently separated veterans, veterans who have separated from active duty within the last 12 months and have priority access to uh, their open jobs throughout the United States. As Walmart hosts a myriad uh, of jobs, a myriad of jobs in our stores and clubs, we also would like to select opportunities in our distribution centers for people to be employed as well. Walmart believes that every recently separated veteran can find employment at Walmart. Even if they don't stay there, it's a good starting point for them to jump into employment other, other places as well. In five years, uh, they expect the project of this commitment to result in the hiring of more than 100,000 veterans. Mm. And in addition to that hiring commitment, 
Walmart supports career opportunities with that as well. And there, there's room for promotion and moving up. Their company is so excited about it that they're deciding to increase it to $20 million over the next five years. And for any veteran that's listening, recently discharged from the military, they can go on Walmart's webpage, uh, uh, walmartcareerswithadmissions.com, and find out more information on this. I thought this was very important that they wanted to come to the Hampton Roads area because of the military presence mm -hmm. here. And uh, so any veteran that's listening, please take advantage of this. I think it's a great opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Edmonds. Uh, Ms. Simmons. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to recognize two really outstanding efforts that our city staff has undertaken in the last week. Um, sometimes we don't remember to say thank you to folks who go above and beyond the call of duty, but on uh, Saturday night, last Saturday night of the holiday weekend, some folks decided it was a good idea to try to steal one of the cannons that sit along the seawall at the foot of High Street. I don't know how they thought they were going to do it. Those things must weigh several tons. But anyway, suffice it to say they were able to unhook some bolts. And um, a resident of Admiral's Landing called uh, to report this. And there were city staff members out rebolting that cannon back to its plate on Saturday night of a holiday weekend. Mm. And I think that's pretty nice, and thank you, Mr. Bagley and your team. And for those who live along Crawford Parkway and the downtown waterfront, um, they will be pleased to know that, thanks to Chief Hargis and a whole lot of other people, the sunken sailboat that's been in Crawford Bay, I think, for about a year, um, was removed today. And so there's no more sunken boat in Crawford Bay as a navigational hazard to boaters. So there are a lot of folks really happy about that. So thank you, Chief Argus. All right, very good. Mr. Moody? Yeah, Mayor, um, I'd like to let citizens know that uh, Council will be having its annual retreat coming up Friday out at uh, Badawi. Uh, gets underway at uh, uh, approximately 9 a.m. in the morning. And it is open to the public. Uh, the public uh, is certainly invited to attend. I like the fact that it is in Portsmouth uh, and people can uh, reach it uh, very easily. Um, it's all day Friday up until 5 p.m. Then uh, we reconvene again on Saturday, uh, July the 13th at uh, 9 a.m. at the same place. And that uh, session runs until uh, 12 noon on uh, Saturday. So. Uh, Hopefully we'll uh, see some uh, folks uh, uh, from the public uh, out there joining us. Absolutely. Well done. Madam Clerk? 13-292, report on pending items. Ms. Bernadette Hall? Um, Dennis Bagley? Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council and citizens. Uh, for the last six months, we've been working on a recycling project, and it just feels like this week that all of the pieces are starting to come together, and um, things are starting to happen so rapidly. And uh, I wanted to report to you tonight uh, on, a, on a lot of different things that are going on. First of all, uh, Monday, uh, our contractor started putting out the, the 95 gallon recycle cans and they started in the, the most north and west portion of the city and they'll be working back uh, towards the Friday route so they'll be starting on the Monday route when they finish the Monday route they'll move over and start on the, on the Tuesday route so citizens will start seeing those cans showing up at their house and we're receiving calls and trying to deal with with issues that that may they may have um, secondly uh, behind the the recycle carts uh, the recycle page is up on, on the website. I've had a, a lot of uh, comments from, from members of council and citizens about getting that up and getting it running, and the marketing staff has done an outstanding job of putting that, uh, that the, the IT stuff in, in, into place. And the mayor is holding up now a, a label that um, will be inside of each one of the cans as the citizen sees uh, the, and opens the can, <laughs> Mr. Moody. 
Uh, <laughs> we're real excited about these cans. I think they're really uh, going to make a lot of people, uh, the ease of recycling is there now. Folks really uh, get excited about recycling. Uh, Facebook um, is up. Uh, Twitter's up. YouTube is up. And we're getting uh, large numbers, email blasts are going out. And I thought it was interesting. I got these numbers yesterday from our marketing staff. Uh, we had um, 4,212 impressions from Facebook. If you're a social media person, you know what that means. If you don't, it doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> it has 75 shares, uh, 260 likes. I think I know what a like is. Uh, 76 comments, and then YouTube had 126 views. So, so everyone start hitting those social media sites so we can get those numbers even higher. There's a lot of information there. If you're questioning about what recycling, uh, it was what is going on with recycling, all that information is out and available to you. Also, uh, if you watch Channel 48, you'll see that there's several PSAs running on uh, several different things. But the main thing I want to talk about is tomorrow night uh, from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock at uh, Badawi Pavilion, there's a meet the driver night. And it's, it's a big event that we've got vendors there who deal with recycling. They'll be able to talk to you about what happens to recycling from the time we pick it up from the curb to the time it's uh, recycled into other um, articles of, of clothing, uh, other items that we use every day. So it's an interesting uh, uh, educational experience. We'll have things for the kids to do. We've got to make a recycle pizza. Uh, there's, uh, we're gonna have ice cream social. If you come, you'll get ice cream in a trash can. If you imagine that, we've got little miniature uh, trash cans that look just like the recycle cans and you'll get a scoop of ice cream in that and you can enjoy yourself and look at all of the, the new trucks are there. Uh, they'll be outside. They're, they're nice and clean and crisp. And most importantly, and I got to tell you uh, that, that our drivers have really gone through a transition because uh, we've gone from having trash truck drivers to equipment operators, and we're trying to em emphasize that. And three of the drivers that we selected for this re recycle program are really excited, and they're getting really involved about what recycling is, and they're ready to talk to people, and uh, you get your picture taken with them. And uh, you've heard from Donna Corbis a, a lot, and she calls them our recycle heroes, uh, environmental heroes, and that's really what they are. They're, they really are excited about what they're doing. And the trucks are beautiful. They've got big signs on the side that say August 19th is our first collection day. So we're really hitting the road running now, uh, trying to get everybody uh, geared up to recycle and keep this ball rolling forward because uh, the more we recycle, the better it is on our environment and certainly uh, saves the city money in the long run. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about recycling or where we are or things that are coming up. Everyone should have their recycle bins by when, Dennis? By the 28th, 29th of July. By the 29th that's, that's of this? Okay. That's depending uh, on the, the schedule uh, staying. Uh, that depends on whether or not they can meet their, their deadlines. Okay. Uh, yesterday they lost four hours in training and some other things happened, but they, they assured me today that they would get caught up uh, before the end of the week. So uh, by the 28th we would expect that. And also you can expect coming in the, in the mail over the next day or so. Hopefully some citizens got those today. They're uh, little uh, flyers that have dates on them. Uh, when your collection date is, it's a calendar with blue and white, and there'll be another follow-up <laughs> mailer coming that actually identifies what uh, whether you're a white week or a blue week. So hold on to that. There's a lot of good information in that. It talks about what we're going to collect and what we're not going to collect, and how you need to, to prepare your items for recycling. And tomorrow at Badawi from five until from five until eight or till everybody leaves. Five until any time you leave, come out and get all the information you want. Now we've reiterated this before. This whole program we're looking at it as a Cost neutral, won't cost the city, citizens, anybody else anything. We're going to pay for this, and the mathematics that we use is based on a 20% participation. That's correct. And I'm sure with all the excitement and all of the inquiries that we've got that we can beat that number. So anything above 20% will, will that be a, a surplus? Is that a good word, Mr. Uh, manager? <laughs> A uh, savings, okay. So uh, let's see if we can't uh, all get out and, and do our part and show up tomorrow to be able to get as much information as we can. And certainly we ought to be able in this city to get greater than 20% participation. Uh, thank you guys for all of what you're doing and uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Clerk. 13-293, non-agenda speakers. Our first speaker, Harold McGill. 
Harold. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carol McGill. I'm from the Craddock section of Portland. Oh, Miss McGill, if you pull the mic down, tell you yes, thank you. I forgot I'm vertically challenged. Okay. Uh, I have a question. I received a city assessment on my property for tax year 1314 of $146,330. Assessment was the same as last year. Think nothing of it. In March, I attempted to refinance from a 15 to a 30 year mortgage. It was denied because my appraisal said my home was worth 120,000. That caused me to appeal the assessment. The Board of Equalization said the assessment is, would not be changed since it was the fair market value of my home. I'm sorry, but I don't see how 120,000 and 146,000 are fair, same fair market value. How was the assessment determined? No specific justification was given on the denial. I would like the city assessed value reduced. How do I proceed with this? It's not. I gave a copy of the paid appraisal to the Board of Equalization at the time of the appeal. They said the appraisal was wrong and the city assessment was correct. I do not see. I saw the five properties they have compared, and there isn't one that exceeds $130,000. I would like an answer to how I go from this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll get somebody to, to get with you, but we have that equalization board made up of independent folks that look at that as a second set of eyes of what our uh, assessor does to make sure we give you that balance and give you that opportunity to do that. And unfortunately, you, you ran across that discrepancy because we don't see that often, do we, uh, Madam? Okay, so we'll get somebody to get you an answer, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Mm -hmm. Sinise Johnson. That's my walking buddy. <laughs> you already being facetious, man. Mm -hmm. You didn't walk. Gonna, you didn't walk with me tonight. when I came out you there. You don't want me to get on you tonight, but because uh, <laughs> I came here to say some things, but I'm gonna be nice. Okay, be, be nice. Very sweet to you tonight. But anyway, good evening. My name is Sinise Johnson, and one of my residents is in the uh, Cavalry Mountain section, lovely Cavalry Mountain section of Portsmouth, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I came tonight. I wanted to talk about the recycling process. But since the gentleman mentioned that they're going to have a meeting tomorrow, battle, we I definitely will be there. But one of my main concerns was whether or not when, the, when uh, you all start uh, pro the process of uh, giving each uh, resident uh, the recycling, new recycling facility, uh, bins, I wanted to know, to have you all planned on uh, notifying, notifying the, the residents about uh, continuing to put their personal household items where, the, where we have the present uh, recycling bins at now? Uh, Mayor, if mm -hmm. you if you were uh, being observant when you was at the Capitol Mountain Tennis Course a couple of weeks ago, uh, you you probably noticed some trash outside the recycling bins, and then I think there was some a couple of chairs that's still there. People have brought brought some household goods over there that's still there, and I've called several times and I asked Mr. Griffin, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, specialists at the Capitol Mountain Center, to notify the city to come up and and, and remove the trash because it's a, it's an eyesore and. Uh, my, my feelings is when, when those recycling bins are removed, people are going to continue to come and sit uh, trash in, on that platform. There's a concrete platform where the recycling bins sit at, and, I'm, and, and it's a concern that they're going to continue to dump. So that was one of my questions, okay. my first question. Do you have any comment on that? No, ma'am, but we'll make sure we keep an eye out and, and, and keep a, a watchful eye on it. As a matter of fact, we've got a rotation per. Um, Mr. Rose, uh, well, go ahead and finish your comments and then we'll respond. And uh, another comment, since you're always talking to me about these tennis courts, mm -hmm. I wanted to let you know that that's not my, one of my lifetime dreams, <laughs> to have the capital amount of tennis courts renovated, because I have other, you know, uh, uh, endeavors of my own that yes, I would like to do while I'm still here. But anyway, I just wanted to, to bring you up to date on some things. 
uh, since I've met with you and the whole entire city council, me and my colleagues, a couple of, I think it was last year, and uh, we all provided you all with a vanilla folder. And in that vanilla folder, we had a lot of information about the USTA. I'm quite sure you've heard of the United States Tennis Association. It's the largest tennis association on the planet, a billion dollar organization. Uh, Serena Williams just won the uh, French Open, you know, but she lost Wilmington. And uh, this year we've had 50 American uh, new uh, prospective prof professionals to join the USTA. So that's inspiring because the USTA is, is trying to encourage uh, more young Americans to get involved with tennis. Because what's going on now, all the trophies, Wilmington Trophy, the US Open Trophy, and French Open Trophy, all those trophies are going to Europeans. So uh, they're trying to motivate and bring young kids into the, into the uh, uh, profession. That's why I'm an advocate. And when we've been for the past five years, we've been had this, the capital amount of some program. But what we, me and my colleagues are doing now, we're, trying, we're going to try to organize a, a summer camp this summer for the, for the kids. So I've already called and asked support in cleaning up the tennis courts because we still got the cracks there. Although you said that they look beautiful to you. You know, you say, oh, they're beautiful, Ms. Johnson. But we still have a lot of work to be done. But anyway, I, I would appreciate if you would become a support, a support, a, a, a very supportive of me and not become an adversary. I really would. Uh, and then I also have met, I just want you to know, I've met with Mr. Rowe, who was very supportive. I met with Margaret Thorne since we talked and, and uh, Brandon Godfrey. And uh, they, they have considered, you know, putting everything on the budget. I know it takes money. You know, but uh, uh, that's what we're working on now. But uh, in the present time, me and my colleagues are doing some professional tennis coaching where we charge. You know, a lesson can, can, can cost as much as $80 an hour. And one of my colleagues had just accepted a, uh, the head teaching pro position at William & Mary. I have three at the uh, Virginia Beach Tennis and Country Club, one at uh, Tidewater, and, and uh, they're trying to recruit me. But uh, at the present time with my other endeavors, you know what I mean, I don't want to take on a full-time coaching job, but I'm very, very sincere in offering, continuing to offer my support to these kids in Capital Mountain. And I would appreciate it if you do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for your support and what you do with those kids. And, and uh, that was one of my reasons to get you off of your porch, Ms. Johnson. When I walked over there to meet with the group to walk, you were on the porch. And I said, how can I get her off of that porch? And I, th I said to Mr. Joe Wright, I'm going to walk over on that tennis court, and I guarantee you she's coming off of that porch. And before I got on that tennis court, you were over there on that court. And so uh, uh, I was trying to provoke you to come out and walk with us, but I appreciate the conversation. And, and seriously, thank you for your efforts. Well, uh, you're right. It's it's important in this country that that sport thrive like all others and that we need to make sure that we have the assets and the facilities to be able to do those things. But thanks, Mr. Moody. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Johnson, being here reminds me about uh, probably about a couple months ago, I thought about Ms. Johnson and her speaking to this body uh, about uh, the condition of the tennis courts in Cavalier Manor. But uh, I had the occasion about uh, two months ago to stop by the tennis courts at Wilson High School. And uh, first time I've been on a tennis court probably in 20 years and probably about 30 pounds ago. Uh, I, was, I was utterly shocked at the condition of the tennis courts. Uh, had the cracks uh, similar to uh, what you describe out in Cavalier Manor. Had weeds uh, growing on the courts. Uh, one of the courts, the net was down on the ground. There was no uh, trash uh, can available. Uh, there was uh, uh, gravel uh, on the court and, and, and other debris. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, recreation facilities and the need for recreation facilities. I challenge us to let's fix what we got uh, before we move on to something new. Let's show that we can keep what we have in good condition. I think it, uh, anybody stopping by those tennis courts, and I'm sure Cavalier Manor the same way, uh, is not conducive to uh, uh, even recreational quality tennis. And, and we need to change that. We, we, we need to, uh, I dare say that probably some of the other tennis courts at, at our schools and other facilities aren't up to par either. So uh, I want to thank you for uh, keeping that on the forefront, uh, Ms. Johnson. Hopefully you'll come here one day and say they're in great shape, they've been fixed, and, uh, you know, the kids are uh, uh, becoming uh, 
little tennis stars. But thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. Ms. Randall. Okay. First of all, I commend Ms. Sinise Johnson, your brother, and the family, because from the beginning, you were the key person, one of the key persons who motivated a need for the residents of Caldea Manor to have the tennis court. And your family and your brother have been out there all the time. And I know Mr. Wright can bear that out because he was out there too pushing for the recreation for the children in that area. I think we've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go when it comes in terms of maintenance of these uh, facilities once we put them out there for the community. That has been one of the shortfalls. So I think if we can pull the communities together to really work, that at one time was the only tennis court that was cemented that children of color to, could play tennis on. And so I think we need to keep that going along because many of the young children got their beginning skills out on that court. And Mr. Wright, I can remember you out there helping to get some of those things put in place too, you and your family. So I think we need to just pull together and the city put in to help. We can have the courts that we once had out there. We had some delightful courts out there, but they were not maintained. And yet we still have a large number of students who are playing tennis. And it adds to the quality of life for the residents in that community. So we're with you all the way. When you come by, our ear is always there to hear what you're saying. Thank you for, don't give up. Thank all you, right. Ms. Randall. Madam Clerk. Ms. Donisai. Good evening. My name is Donna Sai. I live at 3104 Garland Drive. Principal of Liberty 19. Only limited and carefully defined power should be delegated to government, all others being retained in the people. What are the defined powers delegated to the Portsmouth City Council? One of the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, wrote, what is a power but the ability or faculty of doing a thing? What is the ability to do a thing but the power of employing the means necessary to its enforcement? What is a legislative power but a power of making laws? What are the means to enforce a legislative power but laws? Municipal freedom flows directly from the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people. The people's sovereignty blends with their customs and then supported by the city's laws. City institutions bring freedom within people's reach and give them the enjoyment and practice using the, their unalienable rights for peaceful ends. Our representatives are the executives of the will of the people if city council were to introduce some change in the established order of things, they need to return to the source of their power, the citizens. The city council makes laws to protect the dignity and freedom of the individual's American way of life. What powers are retained in the people? The American way of life are the political and economic rights that protect the dignity and freedom of the individual. These are our rights to worship God in our own way, to free speech and press, to peaceably assemble, to petition for redress of grievances, to privacy in our homes of habeas corpus with no excessive bail, to trial by jury, we are innocent until proven guilty, to move about freely at home and abroad, to own private property, to free elections and personal secret ballot, to work in callings and localities of our choice, to bargain, to go into business, compete, make a profit, to bargain for goods and services in a free market, to contract about our affairs, the right to the service of government as a protector and referee, and the right to freedom from arbitrary government regulations and control. Our rights rest in our constitutional government. It was designed to serve the people. Our rights are undergirded by our fundamental belief in God, which is the only reliable basis for sound government and just human relations. Our government in Portsmouth is supposed to be structured to permanently protect the people from the human frailties of our leaders. There is a problem in Portsmouth that prevents our structured government to protect the people from the human frailties of our leaders. What is the problem? 
violation of structured communication. The first breach of structured communication is noted in the Boards and Commission Manual. Has it been updated with the current contact names, dates, and times of meetings and acronyms identified? The second violation of structured communication is the Department of Economic Development, the Planning Department, and Zoning Department, and the Board of Building Code Appeal for failing to work together as a team. Since the Economic Development Department is separated from other departments located at City Hall, the physical separation creates gaps in communication with them. It also gives that department a privilege status by an elite office space paid for by the citizens of Portsmouth. It also puts them in a position to communicate with the Economic Development Authority Chairman on a daily basis. The third breach of structured communication is the Civic Leagues are not part of the decision-making process of certain Economic Development Department and Economic Development Authority projects such as the two breeding investment property contracts. The fourth violation of structured communication is the Mayor's Healthy Initiative in February with a coordination with the Health Department. City Council was not consulted about the headbands that cost the taxpayers $4,000. The Mayor has asked Parks and Recreation, not the Health Department, to incorporate some healthy initiative and workshops on diabetes. The defined powers delegated to Portsmouth City Council by the people are designed to serve the people. Are all the people of Portsmouth being served? No. Our rights are not protected because of the fractured structured communication in our city. We are in the process of experiencing an unjust style of government, a dictatorship. Instead of laws, we are governed by the whims of men. Thanks for listening. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Mr. Mark godaldi gitrowski Good evening, Mr. Mayor, honorable members of council and fellow citizens. Uh, an aside relative to Craddock's 95th annual Independence Day commemoration and parade. Courtesy of Portsmouth City Watch, there is video available on YouTube of that singular event in our city. Uh, just look for Craddock Independence Day, and I think you'll be able to access it. I could give you the link, but you'd think I was speaking a foreign language. I come before you tonight to wish you a happy new year, a happy fiscal new year. As Mr. Rowe pointed out last evening, July 1st marks the beginning of our new financial year in this city, as, as in many cities within the region. I believe that the city should, as a matter of course, be providing information annually to the public about the investments we have made over the years. Specifically, the Renaissance Hotel and Conference Center, the Intellos Pavilion, the Sports Hall of Fame, the Ocean Marine Yacht Facility, Lowe's, and there are others. But, you know, you get the point. Mm -hmm. We, the people, through our tax contributions to the city of Portsmouth, have become partners in the private sector. And we deserve an annual report just as the shareholders of corporations receive annual reports as to the financial viability of those investments. Now, it's important because all the details of all the transactions I enumerated are not in the public realm. There are documents that were signed and negotiated in the back room, and when there was no longer a necessity 
for those items to be kept confidential, they were not published. I believe the public has a right to know what those agreements contain, and the public has a right to see how those investments are performing. Certain representations were made by your predecessors, Mayor, um, and council members, about how these investments were going to improve the bottom line for the city of Portsmouth, improve our standing within the region, and reduce the property tax burden on the citizens. From what I have seen from occasional glimpses into the performance of these assets, that is not the case. In fact, they have consistently drawn money from the general fund because their operations are not fully funded. Their operations and the debt service that the city has incurred are not fully offset by revenues from their operations. <coughs> so at the earliest practical opportunity, I would like the city to file reports on how these assets have performed since we started paying for them and what is being done to improve over time the financial return to the citizens of Portsmouth from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, just want to say I think you've got a very valid point, point well taken, and I think we do deserve, or the citizens deserve to hear a return on their investment and on each one of those things. So uh, maybe that'll some, be something we can discuss in our retreat, and hopefully we can be able to provide you with as much information as we can. That is, uh, I don't think that's out of the realm. Do you, Mr. Manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We actually, uh, I don't know if you was in work session when we talked about the meeting the manager and I just had with the uh, Renaissance, and then there was another meeting with Mr. Moody and the manager with the uh, uh, Pavilion folks. Was yeah, it? Yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, you're absolutely right, and we'll, we'll see if we can't get that, mm -hmm. that in order. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Moody? Thank you, Mayor. To go along that line, uh, it, you know, to ensure that uh, uh, the citizens, in this case, is in effect stockholders uh, in these uh, different uh, entities, uh, the agreements themselves, all of these agreements, I believe, have things that performance clauses of some sort, either things that uh, businesses are supposed to obtain a certain level of employment. In some cases, some cases parking uh, uh, revenue, but uh, you know these businesses, the management changes, uh, sometimes the ownership changes, and I think uh, when it comes to the, those agreements, along with the uh, annual report on the fiscal performance, that we need to also look at the agreement compliance that that all the all the things that we're supposed to do, all the things uh, those parties are supposed to do are being uh, complied with. But uh, your point is uh, very, very valid. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, sir. Good night. Madam Clerk. Our final speaker is Ms. Ursula Murphy. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, yes. Vice Mayor, um, ladies yes. and gentlemen of council. My name is Ursula Murphy, and I work and live in the city of Portsmouth. My reason for being here tonight is to ask you to intervene on behalf of the citizens of Portsmouth in regards to the conditions of our highways and the on-ramps and off-ramps, and secondly, to help resolve a revolving issue regarding the London Boulevard overpass at Broad Street. Uh, my specific concerns regarding our highways or in relation to the grass that has not been cut at all this year by VDOT. The pictures you have before you um, were taken this morning with the exception of the Frederick Boulevard off-ramp picture number one 
that I took on uh, June the 24th. As you can see, the grass along the off-ramp onto Frederick is quite high. The second picture taken this morning shows the grass even higher. And the third picture um, is taken of the on-ramp to 264 westbound from Frederick Boulevard. Mm -hmm. The next picture is of 264 westbound, just, be, just beyond the Victory Boulevard overpass. As you can see, the grass and weeds are quite tall. If a vehicle were to go off the road in this area, it would not be found for the overgrowth. I mean, it's horrible up there. The next picture is of uh, the 264 off-ramp at Greenwood Drive. You will notice that the Eastern Amateur Golf Tournament sign is attached to the exit sign for Greenwood Drive. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eastern Amateur Golf Tournament brings amateur golfers from, and their families from all over the country and the world to Portsmouth. Now, this is not a welcoming sign for these folks. The next three pictures are of the 164 West Norfolk Road on ramps and off ramps. Mm. Uh, I know two council members that drive that road oh, to and from work pretty yeah. much daily. You know. Um, finally, the London Boulevard overpass at Broad Street. I've been complaining for four years about this area. To Miss Hogg's credit, um, she was able to get somebody out there last year to, to cut this overgrowth back. Um, and it was cut one time last year, one time in four years, and that's unacceptable. This roadway is owned by the state of Virginia, well, the Virginia rather. The state pays the city to maintain this roadway, and that's according to VDOT. I don't know who's responsible, and I really don't care. It needs to be taken care of. I offered to um, cut this property last year if I could coordinate with the police department uh, the safety of my employees, myself and my employees. I was uh, informed by Parks and Recreation that I would have to fill out an application, pay a $300 fee to cut this overgrowth. Uh, needless to say, I didn't do it. Um, I just really would like your help with the, all of these issues. Um, as a homeowner and property manager in the city of Portsmouth, I get a courtesy letter from Environmental Services if my grass gets more than 10 inches tall. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that. If I don't cut it within the time frame, which is usually seven days, then um, they will send me a violation notice telling me if I don't cut it, they'll charge me a contractor fee and a $150 administrative fee. You know, and, and, some, and what I'd like to say is, you know, I don't, you're going to hold me to the same, same standards. I want you to hold everybody to the same, same standards. And, you know, I don't want us to be in the newspaper like Hampton was last night where the tall grass, um, they're looking at being the cause of an accident, a deadly accident. So thank you very much. I appreciate your listening. Well, thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit, you can go back to the mic, um, of what... I know uh, a year and a half ago we got into a deep conversation about this very subject. Um, I actually called the VDOT administrator and inquired about their cycle and he told me it's a statewide policy that they're only going to cut three times a year. And uh, that was very disappointing and based on that we actually had the manager last year to go and get some quotes of what it would cost if we did it or we subcontracted it out because we've got about seven of those exit ramps that really um, do our city poor justice and the figures that we got were um, astronomical to be able to pay that cost and so we talked about the beautification piece maybe we taking over the coming out of the downtown tunnel which is the the first impression that is also unkept and uh, some of those other ones. So maybe we need to revisit that again, but the state's only gonna do it three times a year, and uh, this is a Dillon Rule state, and uh, we can hold our <laughs> citizens. We can, we can send a letter to the state, letting them know that the grass is well, it's, it's <laughs> middle, too high. It's but the uh, middle of July. I understand, I, and uh, uh, we're with you, and um, it's bothersome. It is. Because it, it makes a difference of how we look, and, and, and we are, making a concerted effort to beautify our city and do some of the things that just goes with being proud to be in this city and the state is not working with us in that regard and uh, they're letting us know that it's it's statewide though it's only three cuts a year so uh, uh, with that uh, 
Anybody want to add anything to that, Mr. Moody? Uh, yeah, I will, Mayor. I had the occasion to uh, take a road trip of about uh, 700 plus miles to the NASCAR race over the weekend in Daytona Beach. And the thing that uh, was most noticeable, once you get on 95 and get out of the state of Virginia, uh, the roads improve tremendously. Not only do the roads Im improve, uh, the beautification improves. You know, if North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida can beautify uh, their roads, the Commonwealth of Virginia should be able to do it also. Uh, and it gets particularly bad once you make that right-hand turn on uh, uh, 58. 58 East <laughs> off 95, heading to the cul-de-sac mm -hmm. of Hampton Roads. Yep. And, you know, if the state only does it twice a year, I, uh, if, if my Three. colleagues support it, I think we should put it in our legislative package that we want it done more than twice a year. And we want what, what wildflowers planted at our exits. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this thing about, uh, well, we can't do the gasoline tax because it'll raise the price of gasoline. The other thing I noticed on the trip was I purchased gasoline in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. The, the, the lowest I purchased it was 309 a gallon. Now, their gasoline tax is higher than the state of Virginia. My question is, what are we doing with the money? It's certainly not meeting the road. It's certainly not meeting the beautification of the state. I think we, we, we need to get tough. We, we, we need to get a voice as a region, as, as a city, as, as a region of Hampton Roads, and tell them this is not going to be tolerated. We want more. You know, this cul-de-sac, we might be a cul-de-sac, but we not be, we're not going to be a silent cul-de-sac. We want services, we want beautification, and we want roads that doesn't tear our cars up. But anyway, I, I could, I'm like you, I could talk about that for a long time. You're on a roll. Yeah. Here. That's Thank good, sir. Much. All right, yes. uh, Dr. Edmonds. Um, Ms. Matter of fact, I think we all agree. I rattle around and come off these ramps all the time. It looks like a jungle out there. And I think uh, Councilman Moody hit it right on the head. We need to move more aggressively with our legislators to make sure that they try to get it done. And if not, collaborate with the sheriff some kind of way and get working crews out there and prioritize it and start whacking it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe Thank see about you. getting you out there too without having to charge you that $300 fee. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Edmonds. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Simmons. I, I concur with Dr. Edmonds. I was gonna say, I, and I feel like we talked about this in the last oh, couple of days did. about um, Mr. Ray mentioned talking to the sheriff um, about doing this, and, and I think it's, it's worth a phone call, and I bet he'd oblige. The other thing, completely off topic, if you'll forgive me. Yes, ma'am. I forgot something about the museums I really wanted to say. Oh, sure. Okay, sure. May I? Just, just to remind, particularly those at home who are active duty military and their families, our Portsmouth museums are all part of what is called the, the Blue Star Families and the Blue Star Foundation of the United States. And what that means is that all active duty military and their immediate families can go to our museums, the Children's Museum, the Naval Shipyard Museum, the Cultural Center, the Lifeboat, Lifeship Portsmouth for free through Labor Day. And that's underwritten by the Blue Star Foundation. So for those at home watching this, it's a great thing to do on a hot summer day is take your kids particularly to the Children's Museum. Okay, very good. Right, Madam Clerk, we're we done there. There are no additional speakers. Okay, we're adjourned. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>